Greetings and happy National Poetry Month from the New York Society Library. I'm Carolyn Waters, the head librarian. Founded in 1754, the library is New York City's oldest library and a thriving community of readers and writers. We're especially pleased to present the annual Chase Poetry Fund Lecture. These events are sponsored by a fund created by trustee Emerita Lynn Chase, the great patron of poetry in New York City over the decades. This evening, we're honored to have Thomas Trampasano, who is the founding president of the Elizabeth Bishop Society and author of Love Unknown, The Life and Worlds of Elizabeth Bishop. This event is pre-recorded, but Mr. Travisano is online with us tonight and will be happy to converse with you in the chat area of your screen. For information on this event or any events at the library, to purchase the book or to support programs like this, please visit our website at nysoclib.org. Enjoy the presentation. I'm pleased to be speaking to you as a guest of the New York Society Library. And I'm also pleased to be speaking about one of my own favorite topics, the life and work of the poet Elizabeth Bishop. I'm titling my talk, Elizabeth Bishop's Islands of the Imagination. I think we have much to learn during this present unusual moment in national and world history from Elizabeth Bishop's lifelong preoccupation with the opposing claims of solitude and travel, themes that are central to Bishop's life and art. I'm currently speaking to you from a homemade recording studio in uh, my family's home office, uh, rather than at the New York Society Library itself, as we had originally planned. And this is because of the threat of the coronavirus, which has forced each of us in our own way to live uh, in a kind of enclosure. Uh, and such enclosure was actually central to Elizabeth Bishop's early experience. All of us are improvising in different ways. Uh, we've experienced at least a temporary curtailment uh, of our plans for travel. Uh, and instead are traveling and achieving connection through virtual means uh, and by means of our imaginations and our memories. Uh, Bishop would have found all of this, to use a phrase from one of her poems, not unfamiliar. Elizabeth Bishop as a poet and a person has been a fascination of mine for more than 40 years. Bishop, as many of you know, was an American poet and short story writer who was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1911 and had important roots in Canada through her mother's family, the Boomers. As a result of a series of early emotional and physical traumas, including the death of her father when she was eight months old, the permanent uh, mental institutionalization of her mother when she was five, a persistent tug of war between the Bishop and Boomer families in Worcester and Great Village, Nova Scotia, over her uh, care and uh, uh, control of her as a person and uh, control of her future. Uh, we've also only recently discovered uh, evidence of verbal, sexual, and emotional abuse by one of her maternal uncles. And all of this led to a series of uh, physical and emotional breakdowns, which caused acute and chronic uh, asthma and eczema that nearly killed her when she was seven years old and led to a period of isolation when she was too sick to go to school between the ages of seven and 15. Uh, She was confined to a small apartment in Revere, Massachusetts that was dominated by her abusive uncle. She lived in a relatively poor neighborhood. She had very few, if any, friends who shared her interests. Uh, and she spent most of her time during this period, as she recalled, lying in bed, wheezing and reading. She knew a lot about isolation and separation. In the current pandemic, many of us are experiencing the impact of interrupted schooling, 
on ourselves and on our children and grandchildren. Um, in Bishop's later years, she became celebrated as a world, world traveler, and her wanderlust was surely fueled, at least in part, by the isolation of her early years. Even in her teens, Bishop was a brilliant poet, and the poems she wrote during that early period explore the conflicting claims of enclosure and travel. Uh, I've described her early mature poetry, the poetry she began publishing just after attending Vassar College, as fables of enclosure. They all grow out of that early experience and they tend not to deal directly with everyday facts. Uh, the poems that she wrote after that, from her mid-twenties on, uh, after she began her life as a world traveler, uh, chronicle in incredibly vivid detail her experience uh, along the New England and Nova Scotia coastlines, as well as in New York's Greenwich Village, uh, in Paris, in North Africa, in Florida, on the island of Key West, and during almost a quarter century, uh, half a world away in Brazil. And uh, as many of you know, she was an incredibly uh, vivid and brilliant observer of the world that she had felt isolated from during her earliest years. Uh, Bishop was an extraordinary letter writer, and over uh, a lifetime she composed not only poems, memoirs, and stories, but thousands of letters that vividly and very hilariously sometimes chronicle her experience on three continents. I had the privilege of serving as principal editor of Words and Air the complete correspondence between Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell. Bishop was once regarded as an author uh, with a relatively small body of work. Many have noted that she, uh, that when she died, she left behind only about a hundred uh, exquisitely crafted poems, but uh, Robert Lowell himself accurately predicted that when Bishop's letters are published, as they will be, she will be recognized not only as one of the best, but as one of the most prolific writers of our century. Words and Air, the book I uh, edited, uh, comes to more than 900 pages, and it's just one of many volumes of Bishop's correspondence now are in, in print or currently in preparation. And much of her work in draft, such as poems, uh, notebooks, memoirs, short stories, has now also seen print or uh, is in preparation. Uh, collected works of Elizabeth Bishop will probably not appear in my lifetime, uh, and when it does, it will be a very uh, large collection of volumes indeed. During Bishop's lifetime, she won the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, uh, the Newstat International Award, but it was only in the years following her death, and particularly since the early 1990s, that Bishop came to be recognized as a major American and world poet, a figure who Dwight Garner has recently suggested might be, and I'm quoting, the most purely gifted poet of the 20th century. Certainly, her gift as a poet showed a uh, early signs because she wrote her first brilliant poem at the age of 15, The Ballad of the Subway Train. Um, I, f I first discovered Bishop in a graduate class on contemporary poetry in 1975. It was love at first sight or at first reading, and I've been hooked on her ever since. One thing that fascinated me was this mysterious but absolute control over poetic craft that she evidenced uh, from my first encounter with her. Another was the mysterious way she had of blending interiority and exploration. These powerful characteristics still hold a fascination for me, and she's never lost her capacity to surprise me. She once said that surprise was the most important quality that a poem could have, and Bishop herself was a master of surprise, both in her life and in her work. In 19, 
77, I began a doctoral thesis on Bishop, uh, which I titled Elizabeth Bishop Introspective Traveler. Uh, that was completed in 1981 uh, and was the first dissertation to explore Bishop's entire career. Uh, the first of my many books on uh, Bishop and the Poets of Regeneration, which was a development on my thesis, was published in 1988, and I've been exploring Bishop's life and work ever since as a critic, editor, literary journalist, and uh, the founding president of the Elizabeth Bishop Society. This past November, with the publication of my biography, Love Unknown, The Life and Worlds of Elizabeth Bishop, I've had the opportunity to pull together uh, my experience of uh, working on Bishop and uh, I think present it to the general public in a way that uh, readers might find engaging. In fact, I was very pleased uh, that uh, the reviewer for the Washington Post said that uh, this book was as fun to read as Bishop's uh, mysterious and powerful poems. Um, so much by way of background. Now I'd like to focus on a specific piece of writing that Bishop published in a boarding school magazine in 1929 when she was 18 years old. I discovered it and got it published in the Gettysburg Review in 1992. So I'll read it from that Gettysburg Review edition. The title of this essay, uh, perhaps appropriate to my focus is, uh, on being alone. And I'm going to read an extended bit of this piece. And remember, this is written by an 18 year old. Uh, there is a peculiar quality about being alone, an atmosphere that no sounds or persons can ever give. It is as if being with people were the earth of the mind, the land with its hills and valleys, scent and music. But in being alone, the mind finds its sea the wide, quiet plain with different lights in the sky and different, more secret sounds. But it appears that we are frightened by the first breaking of its waves at our feet. And now we will never go on voyages of discovery, never feel the free winds that have blown over water and never find the islands of the imagination where live who knows what curious beasts and strange peoples. Being alone can be fun. Alone, the mind can do what it wants to without it. Sorry. Alone, the mind can do what it wants to without even the velvet leash of sleep. Okay, not bad writing for an 18 year old and also setting up themes that we will encounter in Bishop uh, for the rest of her life. The, exploration, the search for islands of the imagination, which might be real, which might be virtual. She had a fascination with the sea and its shore. At least half of her poems are in some form seascapes. Um, for her, the sea had a powerful lure. Her favorite way to travel was by freighter, um, and it was by freighter that she uh, entered uh, Brazil, that place that would hold her for uh, almost 25 years. Uh, one of her late great poems was titled Crusoe in England, and it explores another island of the imagination. She retells the story of Robinson Crusoe, uh, and he's now in England. He's back from the island that he had inhabited for so long in a state of isolation with only goats and extinct volcanoes and layers of guano um, to uh, as companions. And uh, at one point, Crusoe uh, discovers uh, a uh, kind of fruit, a berry that grows on uh, the one local bush in the area, and he turns it into home brew, into homemade alcohol. Uh, and he says, I drink the awful, fizzy, stinging stuff that went straight to my head and play my homemade flute. I 
think it had the weirdest scale on earth. And Dizzy, whoop, and dance among the goats. Homemade, homemade, but aren't we all? Bishop sort of became a homemade person. Uh, she didn't have a normal schooling experience. She had to kind of create and define herself uh, on her own terms. Uh, in some way, perhaps we're all homemade. None of us is quite following. The standard formula that was laid out to us, uh, certainly if you're listening to this talk, you might be a little bit different from the average individual uh, who walks this earth. And uh, here I am in a homemade uh, filming studio looking at an iPhone that's propped up on a series of books and talking to you right now. Uh, we are all experiencing uh, the homemade world in our own terms. Um, Bishop was a searcher. She was an explorer. Uh, and that's something that I felt was very important to get out in this biography. In fact, at the center of my biography is an idea that I uh, put into a paragraph in my uh, prologue to the biography. And I'm just going to read a little bit of this. It has become an axiom among critics that Bishop's lifelong dedication to travel was determined in large measure by a search for home. Critics are always talking about home in Elizabeth Bishop. Yet travel was not simply a search for security or shelter. It was also a search for adventure, risk, and discovery, a search for friendship and lasting love, a search for artistic material, and perhaps most important, a quest for freedom that found its basis in a childhood marked by loss, isolation, and constraint. Again, it seems to me that that experience of separation, isolation, was at the very core of her uh, psyche and her existence, and she resisted it. She did not want to surrender to it, and yet it was always a powerful defining element in her work. Uh, the islands of imagination can be both positive and negative. Um, in Crusoe in England, she uh, uses her intense observation of flora and fauna, and at the same time, her powerful experience of isolation to create an incredibly memorable poem. Uh, going back to my prologue, the art of losing Bishop ruefully celebrated with such poignant irony and perhaps her most famous poem, One Art, was linked in equal part to a life and art of finding, an art demanding the sort of encounter, appraisal, and understated epiphany that appears uh, in such abundance in her work. A counter, encounter, appraisal, understated epiphany. If you're familiar with Bishop's work at all, I think you'll recognize that these are elements in virtually every poem that she wrote. And Bishop wrote to Robert Lowell in a letter once, kind of reflecting on her early experience and then on her uh, later approach to life. Uh, she was explaining her passion for accuracy. And she was frequently, when she received a, a, a poem from Robert Lowell, she would say, this is very good, but you're not quite accurate in a few of your details, and I think you should correct these little things. And Lowell usually followed her advice. Uh, she says about this passion for accuracy, since we do float on an unknown sea, I think we should examine the other floating things that come our way very carefully. Who knows what might depend on it? And who knows what might depend on the little tiny gestures that we are engaging in at the present moment. Um, now, one of the things that I think characterized or helped to shape my biography is the one meeting I had with Elizabeth Bishop. She was giving a reading at the University of Virginia where I was writing my doctoral thesis in 1978. Uh, I was already pretty well into my thesis and my thesis advisors arranged for me to have breakfast with her. And I talked to her for about an hour 
We had a pretty good one-on-one -on -one exchange. I had the feeling she was a little bit wary about me because I probably knew quite a bit about her and she didn't know exactly what it was. Uh, and she was a very self-protective person, perhaps understandably, partly through her early experience and also partly because she was gay uh, in a homophobic society. And when she grew up, the society was even more homophobic. Um, I almost certainly knew that. How was I going to handle that in my writing about her? And uh, at the same time, and perhaps partly as a form of self-protection, uh, she told a series of extremely funny stories. I got a very powerful sense of her sense of humor. And the story that I remember most vividly was very characteristic of her. She was, she told a story about uh, a little bit of exploration that she was doing in Brazil, uh, where she, as I said, lived for about 25 years. She was always exploring the Brazilian interior. Her partner, Lada de Macedo Suarez, who was a wealthy and multi-talented member of the uh, Rio de Janeiro elite, now was very contemptuous of uh, traveling away from the coast of Brazil. Nothing of interest could be there. But Bishop uh, went to tropical rainforest. She traveled on the Amazon. And on this occasion, she was going on one of the small tributaries of the Amazon. I think it was the Rio Negro. And when she traveled in Brazil, she said, she always brought, brought with her a bright light bulb because she found the light bulbs in Brazil were too dim for her to be able to read by at night. And she would put the light bulb into the uh, lamp and turn it on and she'd be able to read. So she has this perhaps 100 watt light bulb with her uh, on this little tramp steamer going up the uh, Amazon, I mean, up, up the Rio Negro, sorry. And uh, she screws it in, turns it on, and blows out the power uh, on the entire side of the little uh, riverboat that she was on. And then she quickly unscrewed the light bulb and put the old one back so people would not know that it was her who had uh, done this terrible thing. Um, now, Somehow that is very characteristic of her, uh, and uh, it was that sense, her perspective on the world, her approach to the world, that I really wanted to convey in the biography. Um, and uh, I'd like to just um, quote a little bit more uh, from one of her letters to Robert Lowell. Bishop knew a lot of very famous people. Um, one of whom was Pauline Hemingway. When she lived in uh, Key West, uh, which she did for about 10 years, she was a close friend of Pauline Hemingway, the second wife of Ernest Hemingway. And Pauline owned the house that is now the famous Hemingway Home and Museum in Key West. Many of you may have visited this place, which is a very popular tourist attraction. Well, Bishop as Pauline's friend, visited the house many times. And when she arrived in Brazil, it was just after um, Hemingway was departing uh, to uh, get involved in a relationship with the woman who became her, his third wife, Martha Gellhorn. So Pauline is uh, alone in the house with her uh, sons and Bishop is a frequent visitor. And uh, later on, Pauline was away and Bishop was uh, staying in the Hemingway house as a uh, guest by herself and actually in the place that is uh, described as Hemingway's studio. That was her quarters. And she was swimming in the famous swimming pool, and uh, which uh, she describes in a letter to Robert Lowell. The swimming pool is wonderful. It is very large, and the water uh, from away under the reef is fairly salt. Uh, also, it lights up at night. I find that each underwater bulb is five times the voltage of the one bulb in the lighthouse across the street. So the pond must be visible to Mars. It is wonderful to swim around in a sort of green fire. 
one's friends look like luminous frogs. Now, luminous frogs is poetry, and uh, many of Bishop's letters turn into a kind of comic uh, or serious prose poetry. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by her. One can just keep reading and reading her letters and they comment on the poetry, but they have significant literary value in and of themselves. And they're often written with a kind of fluency and freedom that we don't encounter in the exquisitely crafted poems. So they give us kind of a uh, another side of her as a writer, and we really need both sides to be able to fully appreciate her literary and her human achievement. Um, I want to look for a minute at uh, another one of her letters. One of the things that helped Elizabeth Bishop to decide to stay in Brazil was a gift that she received on her birthday. Some of you may know the story that Bishop arrived uh, by freighter in Brazil in November of 1951. And she went to visit uh, Lara, who uh, she already knew from New York, and she was planning to stay for a couple of weeks. But she uh, bit into the fruit of the cashew and had an allergic reaction. She was very allergic to many things. Her head swelled up the size of a pumpkin. Uh, she had to spend a couple of weeks in the hospital. Uh, by then she had missed the freighter she was planning to take and she needed to recover physically. So she was still there on February 8th, uh, her 40th, uh, her 41st birthday. Um, and Lada engineered the gift of something she wasn't expecting, a toucan. Uh, Bishop loved animals and she had told Lada that her dream in life was to own a toucan, and suddenly this zookeeper gave her a toucan. Now, I think Lada arranged that gift because she wanted Bishop to stay. Bishop interrupted a letter to friends because her birthday party was starting, and the day after, she wrote back to these friends about the gift of the toucan, and she describes him after only 24 hours of acquaintance uh, in this way, and his name was Sammy for Uncle Sam. He has brilliant electric blue eyes, gray blue, gray blue legs and feet. Let me try that again. He has brilliant electric blue eyes, gray blue legs and feet. Most of him is black, except the base of the enormous bill is green and yellow, and he has a bright gold bib and bunches of red feathers on his stomach and under his tail. She was also pleased to report on Sammy's singular digestive habits. He eats six bananas a day. I must say they seem to go right through him and come out practically as good as new. Meat, grapes, to see him swallowing grapes is rather like playing a pinball machine. Uh, now, Bishop's letters to Brazil are quite amazing. They're often marvelous. Uh, they give us a feeling of uh, of this place that is uh, quite unique. Uh, she was living in a construction site uh, when she first arrived at Samambaya, which was later to become um, a kind of architectural treasure, a hypermodern house that Lada designed with Sergio Bernardes, who's one of the leading uh, uh, Brazilian architects of the mid-century. Um, and uh, I'll read a little bit about the letters that she wrote. Many of Bishop's epistolary friends have acknowledged that the receipt of a Bishop letter was marked for them as a special occasion. Uh, Pearl Kazin, who was a close friend and the uh, sister of the famous critic Alfred Kazin, described her early letters from Brazil as appearing in flimsy airmail envelopes and offering, quote, quote a free associating potpourri of domestic details literary gossip and judgment, politics, landscape, lamentation, weather, and joy. The joy she felt at no longer being alone, of living in a house alive with noisy, suckering normality. Now, that was not the kind of house that Elizabeth Bishop lived in as a child. Uh, she lived alone with her abusive uh, uncle and her 
loving but meek uh, aunt, and uh, she had no friends of her own age. And uh, so to find a home that was full of busy, suckering normality was an incredible discovery for her, especially if it came along with this brilliantly colored toucan uh, that could be her own personal pet. Uh, Bishop also describes things like partisan review arriving on horseback uh, and uh, walking stick bugs coming into the house uh, along with bats and, uh, and moths because the walls were not yet finished. And it was this kind of experience that might have repelled other North Americans that Bishop found extremely attractive about Brazil. Now, um, in her final years, uh, after her relationship with uh, Lada de Macedo Suarez unfortunately broke down, um, Lada committed suicide uh, uh, under very ambiguous circumstances. And I go into that in considerable detail in my biography. And if you want to learn about that, you can, you can read. Uh, I'd like to, she uh, spent her final years at Harvard University where she taught uh, starting in 1970, a job that was arranged for her by Robert Lowell uh, and other uh, admirers at Harvard. And uh, she had a long relationship with a much younger woman named Alice Methvessel. Um, and she was beginning to be recognized uh, as a great American poet. In particular, uh, she was recognized in Boston itself where she was a familiar figure. And uh, when she died, uh, some of her poems were still unpublished. Uh, they were in the hands of the New Yorker. Uh, and um, a poem called Sonnet, uh, I was able to read after Bishop's death when it appeared in the New Yorker just a, about a week or two after she died. And that poem was read uh, by Lloyd Schwartz, who was a friend of hers and one of her editors and one of my great personal friends, um, at a uh, memorial service for her at Harvard University. Um, and I closed the book with uh, a sort of reading and analysis of that poem, Sonnet. Uh, it's actually a upside down Petrarchan sonnet with the six line section coming first and the eight line section or octave coming last. And the lines are very short, unlike a normal sonnet. So Bishop is having fun with form as she frequently did. And I'd just like to read the end of this and then, um, uh, wrap things up. So, um, the two sections of the poem, the sestet and the octave, which again are in reverse order, uh, are marked by two key terms in Bishop's lexicon, caught and freed. Caught in the carpenter's spirit level of the poem, a mere bubble of air becomes the symbol, a symbol for the human condition perhaps even a metaphor for Bishop herself, a creature divided. The compass needle that also appears in the poem takes on equally human characteristics, wobbling, wavering, undecided. The first word freed, uh, the first freed figure in the poem, uh, caught and freed being the key terms, the first freed figure in the poem depicts a seemingly random escape from confinement the broken thermometer's mercury running away. The poem's final image is its most complex, occupying what might be called pure bishop terrain. The bevel of a mirror is the slanting edge that tucks inside a mirror's frame. Um, and uh, if the sunlight hits this slanting glass just right, the glass becomes a prism, and the refracted light might be said to emerge like, as Bishop says in the poem, a rainbow bird from the narrow bevel of the empty mirror flying wherever it feels like, gay. Now Lloyd Schwartz recalled that Bishop declared to him <clears throat> that here she was attempting to reclaim the word gay for its traditional usage, but such a word in this context seems alive and rainbow-edged, as Bishop said about Robert Lowell's poetry. 
Bishop often claimed that poetry should be as unconscious as possible. Was it impossible then that in composing her final line, Bishop was unconsciously linking her word freed and rainbow and gay with the rainbow flag Gilbert Baker famously unfurled at San Francisco's Gay Freedom Day Parade in the summer of 1978, not long before Bishop submitted her sonnet to the New Yorker. Now, I think this is a characteristic of Bishop. She often tried to pretend to others and perhaps even to herself that her poems were not as political, politically charged and as personal as they actually were. Uh, let me conclude with the final paragraph of my biography. In Questions of Travel, one of her great Brazilian poems, Bishop meditates on continent, city, country, society, concluding that the choice is never wide and never free. But throughout her life, in search of as much freedom as she could achieve amid the choices she found open, Bishop was always willing to accept risk. No doubt, at many moments in her life, she felt like the bubble in the spirit level or like the wavering compass needle. But through her art and in the body of her words, she had finally become the rainbow bird, freed. I hope in this talk I've helped you to think about not only the islands of imagination in Bishop's work, but the islands of, of the imagination that we all share and the ways that we can find connection uh, between ourselves and others uh, through words and through the imagination and through the memories that we share. Thank you very much.